hello. Um, my name is Maurice Kwiatkowski. I'm a veterinarian at the School of Veterinary Medicine um, in Davis, California. Um, for the 14 participants that are online, can we just confirm that, that you guys, via the chat, that you guys have, are able to, to hear me speak and you guys can see um, your video screen? Loud and clear, they say. Okay, great. So if you do have problems, um, that chat box is meant for um, people to be able to interact with kind of our IT folks um, and also to ask questions. So um, feel free to use that. And then as we get to different points um, in our discussion, we can answer those um, depending on the speaker if they want to answer it uh, during their presentation or if they want to answer it um, at the conclusion of their presentation. We will get to your questions. If we do get a flood of questions, we'll just make sure if we don't have time that we do um, respond to them in a timely fashion. Um, just so you guys all know, all of this is being recorded. So um, you guys will all have access to these talks. So if you like to take notes, that's great. But if you don't like to take notes and you just want to listen, um, that's also um, an option. Um, just a couple housekeeping things before we get started. So if you're in the room, um, the old-fashioned way, listening to the workshop. Um, the bathroom is going to be uh, two left turns. So if you go outside of this door, you make a left turn, and then make another left turn. The bathroom will be on your left-hand side. There's some snacks also over here. You guys are free to, um, to enjoy. Um, if you are on the Zoom meeting, obviously you don't get the snacks, um, and you know where the bathroom is. I'm not going to tell you where that is. Um, but um, uh, like I said, uh, feel free to interact via the chat boxes, either if you have IT issues or if you have questions, and um, we'll get to those um, in a timely fashion. Um, before we get started, is there anyone online that has any questions um, about how we're going to proceed tonight? The one thing I want to be really aware of, especially for all the speakers, is that uh, we have people here in a lot of different time zones. So I think we even have someone who signed up um, in, uh, in Norway. We have someone who signed up in Mexico. Uh, we have people who signed up across the United States. So I really want to make sure that we stay within our time uh, limits as much as possible. Um, the thing I really want to reiterate is that, to me, the most important part of tonight is this is the first of five of a series of workshops. So the next one will be next Tuesday night at the same time period. The one after that will be the following Wednesday night. Thursday night, and so on and so forth. Um, the point that I want to make is the most important thing I think that you can do during these workshops is uh, get to know the speakers, get to know the attendees, um, because at the end of the day, the way that you're going to um, be able to troubleshoot questions and answer things that you're unclear of is by being able to work with all the people that are, are in the room and that are resources. Um, I can certainly always ask, Act, act as a uh, hub um, in order, when you do have questions, I can um, make sure that um, those questions get answered by experts, either at UC Davis or UC Riverside, um, or in you know, the entire, you know, the way the world works now, um, we have access and um, to, to all kinds of expertise around the world. That's really just one email away. The hard part's really just finding the right person to ask who you should ask that question on. So tonight, hopefully, you're starting to learn about who your network is, who you can ask questions to, who your resources are, um, and, and hopefully we can kind of, um, kind of go from there. I think that's really important, and hopefully um, you guys are all able to start uh, interacting with us. I know for, for me, uh, if you go onto my website, you can find my email address, you can find my cell phone number, you can find my office number. Um, it's part of my job to answer questions or to help people answer questions. So. Um, I hope that um, this starts that type of relationship where you guys um, continue to kind of ask questions and hopefully I can help you and we can go from there. So I um, wanted to get started uh, with our first talk, uh, which is on husbandry of pastured-based uh, poultry. Um, and you can see kind of the picture here with the hen that's staring you uh, right between the eyes. Um, this is the UC Davis pastured poultry farm. So we started this a couple of years ago um, with the idea that um, there is a lot more free range and pastured poultry production, commercial free range and commercial pastured poultry production 
around the U.S. than there used to be. And we don't really have a lot of knowledge and um, information sharing when it comes to this type of commercial production. Uh, when you go to these conventional operations, uh, the universities have done a great job, in my opinion, uh, over the years and decades of working with those commercial operations to address questions of food safety, uh, productivity, uh, husbandry, welfare. Um, but this kind of niche here, um, especially in California, hasn't really been uh, addressed. So what we were able to do is we were able to get some funds from um, the University of California to help um, start this farm. And then we got some additional funds from the USDA um, to continue this project. And big picture, the, the, the vision of what we're trying to do here is we're not trying to make money. Um, we're not trying to be a real farm per se, but really what we're trying to do is address the research questions, the challenges that pasture poultry and free range and other alternative production systems have with respect to welfare, food safety, production efficiency, management, et cetera, et cetera. So we do research here, but our research is really guided by you guys. So what I really encourage people to do is if we are not addressing something that you think is critical, um, or you think it's interesting, or you think it's really important, then you need to kind of interact with us because then we need to hopefully um, write grants that can allow us to do um, the kind of work that answers the questions that you guys um, are are trying to address. So um, again, that's you know the, the 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 theme throughout the night is not each one of us coming up here and speaking to you guys. Hopefully, it's about us kind of starting to get to know each other and then. Um, try to address the challenges that you guys have moving forward um, in this segment of poultry production. The other reason I really want to point that out is that um, these type of systems have challenges. There's no perfect poultry system, um, and we'll talk a little about those throughout this evening. Um, but at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk a little about some of the resources that you have. And at the beginning of my talk, I'm going to talk about different resources that you have. But it's really important to note that these production systems have challenges, especially with respect to disease control. And we have a very significant outbreak of virulent Newcastle disease in Southern California right now. And it's really important that we manage these systems as best as possible in order to prevent any kind of diseases from getting uh, and affecting our flock. Um, so we'll talk about that a little. I know Dr. Bland, um, who's a commercial poultry veterinarian, will probably talk about that a little, what's going on in Southern California. And the goal is really um, to, to still allow you and to hopefully um, encourage you to use the best possible practices to protect our birds, um, because that's going to make us more profitable, that's going to be more sustainable, um, that's going to produce a better product, um, and, and et cetera. Not moving. First IT. Bear with us for a minute. Okay. Formal. So when you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, and um, either someone can read them from the back, from the back, or we can get to those um, at the end. Um, but I want to make sure that again, this is not you know this kind of didactic you know kind of junior high school lecture, but hopefully there's an interaction and you guys have questions. I promise you, I will not know the answer to many of your questions, but the goal is to try to then you know identify people who can try to answer those questions. So. I want to identify, especially because there's a lot of people here that are from California, I want you to realize what your resources are. Because the goal of tonight is not just to give you three hours of PowerPoint. The goal is to really show you what your resources are. Um, so it's really important um, that um, I think people kind of have a general understanding of what cooperative extension is. It's in every single state. And basically, it's a university-based research and knowledge sharing program. They have folks like myself that are in cooperative extension at UC Davis, and my job is to focus on poultry health and food safety. And my job is to, if you look at the mouse, is to work with researchers um, and to make sure that that information is extended 
to the poultry industry and to backyard poultry producers and alternative poultry producers. Some of that research is my own. A lot of it is other people's research. And again, the goal is to really make sure that that research information is delivered to the farmers. That all seems, I think, really intuitive, probably to most of the people in the room. I can promise you and tell you from my experience just working around the world, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So if you go to China and you go to Indonesia and you go to these other countries, they have great universities. Um, you walk on there, you feel like you're in a university. There's people that are doing all kinds of great work. But for whatever reason, they don't have a system where they then go out to the farm to work with the farmer. So that information kind of lags there. And we all know it's really important not just to do the research, but to get that, that best research in the hands of people that are um, doing the actual work. Um, so in California, we're really lucky. We have a very large cooperative extension program. It's not just in poultry. It goes all across you know, every aspect of agriculture, uh, human nutrition, uh, child development. Um, there's just a lot of different aspects there. And I encourage you, um, to find out where your cooperative extension uh, county office is, and then, um, if necessary, interact with them. If you have questions on trees or plants or nutrition or poultry, whatever it be, um, that's the way you would interact either with folks like me at the university or um, in, in your individual county. This is the same system um, in your, if you, people that are listening from other states, you guys have a very similar system. California is a very large ag state, so our system might be a little bit, might be a little bigger, not better, um, might be a little bigger, but if you, if there are uh, very similar systems with the same structure um, in, in your state also. So if you type in UC Davis and poultry, you'll get to a website, um, and um, that website has all kinds of resources. Um, and I just want to go over some of those resources that you guys have. Um, on the left-hand side here, you can see this UC Davis Pastor Poultry Farm, and you saw some pictures earlier, and we'll talk a little more about that um, and some of the things that we're working on, hopefully that address some of the questions that you have. Um, if you scroll down on the second slide here, you can see the projects that um, involve our farm, and it's pretty large. Um, so we do a lot of work with data acquisition, so trying to teach farmers and work with farmers in order to uh, collect data so they can understand profitability, they can understand um, whether their vaccines are working or not working, um, they can understand what um, breeds of birds are more productive um, in different conditions, because we don't know a lot about that in these free range and pasture environments. We know a lot about that in a controlled um, conventional setting, but not very much about that in a um, uncontrolled, pastured, and free-range system. Um, we do a lot of work with black soldier fly larvae. So the primary cost that farmers pay, uh, whether you are pastured or free-range or uh, conventional, the most expensive capital cost that you have on every single flock is feed. 70, up to 70% of the cost associated with raising a flock of birds is associated with, with, with feed. So if we can find more efficient ways to feed birds, whether it be pasture, whether it be black soldier fly larvae, then that's a huge innovation and that has a lot to do with uh, the difference between being profitable and not profitable. So we do a lot of work with that. Uh, we do a lot of work with food safety, understanding the risk of salmonella on these farms, understanding the best ways to control uh, predators. So I encourage you to go on to, to this website um, and click around. Um, and ask questions and email myself and, and some of the other resources that, that are here. This is a really important, um, also this, is, this, this middle uh, pane here with the diagram is really important to understand um, and to know your resources. The goal here today, again, is like for us to interact with each other. So if you're gonna take home one thing from today, or at least from my slide, I would take this home right here. And you can find this on our website if you scroll down from this figure on our website, it will take you to all the contact information. So if you have dead bird issues, you have high mortality, um, high morbidity, um, if you have questions on flock management, um, if you have ectoparasite questions, um, we have all the different experts um, that you can identify. So um, one of the things that I do, being an extension, is that someone might call me and ask a question about um, mites or fleas, or ticks, and I can help them up to a certain level. Um, but the other option is that they can click on this ectoparasite box, and they can um, 
identify the faculty at UC Riverside that do a lot of work that are um, that do a lot of work with ectoparasites and poultry. If you have welfare questions, food safety questions, avian disease questions, etc., um, this is a really good resource. Doesn't mean that we're going to know all the answers, um, but we're going to work with you. These are your tax dollars. These are all people that are um, part of either the state, federal, or on the university system. So we're here to help you guys um, and, and give you what we think is hopefully the best information. And if we don't know the answer to that, then, then we don't know the answer to that. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things then that we take home and we say this is stuff that we need to do research on. Um, on our additional resources section, um, one of the things that we have here is information, for example, that top um, one is how to test for Salmonella enteritidis in your backyard coop. Um, obviously, the people that are here are interested in commercial production, but the, the way that you would test for salmonella, this type of salmonella, which is the most common salmonella associated with food safety issues in poultry, um, is by going to that link and we uh, walk you through how to collect a sample and how to submit that to a diagnostic lab. That's really important. The law in California and the law in the United States right now says that if you have below 3,000 laying hens that you do not have to do that type of surveillance. But I can tell you there are the Whole Foods of the world and other type of co-op type places. Their insurance is not going to ask them if you are below 3,000 hens or not to whether you are actually going to surveil for salmonella enteritis. You're going to be required to do that in order to be basically to, to prove to them um, and to prove that you're not a risk to them. So, this kind of information here, we're working on making videos of. Uh, we have a video um, on some vaccinations against salmonella. Um, there's a lot of information here that, that hopefully can help you um, and address some of the questions. The reason all this information is here is basically because we've gotten questions from pasture poultry producers, free range producers in the past that are saying, look, we don't have a good way of figuring out how to drag swab our poultry coop for salmonella enteritis. Can you create a video for that? And that's the kinds of stuff that, that we try to, that's why that interaction between um, hopefully us and you guys is, is really important. Um, on the right hand side, you can see our resources section. Um, you know, we have a very large engineering team, so I encourage you to actually look at our innovation um, section where we talk about coop design, um, we talk about how to uh, generate a Google form, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. Um, we talk about some of the predator control approaches that we've um, uh, developed in concert with the, um, some of these producers, because those are real big, big issues that they have. Um, you'll see some of the other, those type of things there. Um, and again, I think what, what makes our group hopefully somewhat useful is that not only are we veterinarians and animal scientists and behaviorists, but we also have engineers in our group, and those engineers are, are really valuable in that we can interact, and we can interact with them um, and have them uh, help with uh, some of the design challenges that yeah, I think that you guys might, might, um, might typically might, might have. So without going into too much detail here, we do have a newsletter called Poultry Pondering that comes out quarterly. Um, so you can go on to the website and you can become a, um, uh, a member of our poultry pondering that will get sent out every quarter to you. If you look on your left hand side, you'll see an article about one of our new coop designs there that was made by um, several of our engineering students and um, their uh, advisor. Um, that coop design, you know, I think we had a, we went through several iterations to get to that. If you look at the uh, middle pane, you can kind of see uh, one of our other coop designs, uh, but you'll see an article on uh, also in poultry pondering addressing some of the food safety issues associated with the recent fires that we've gone through in California. How safe are our eggs to eat if our birds are eating ash off the ground, for example? We don't really know very much about that. So um, we are doing um, some research there and we're trying to communicate that um, via poultry pondering to uh, producers and farmers like yourself. Um, and then, unfortunately, the, the topic of, of the day or of the last several months in California, we have a, a large, virulent Newcastle disease outbreak in Southern California. Um, so um, we do have information in English and Spanish on um, how best to protect your birds, recommendations for, uh, for control, and recommendations for vaccination um, if, you're, if, you're, um, if you're so inclined. We can talk about that also um, a different time. 
So in that resources section, one of the things that uh, we have is we have some of the articles that we've published, um, and you're free to read those. Those get a little dense just because of the nature of how those are written. But I want to kind of summarize some of the findings because we've done, we started two, three, actually probably three, four years ago, excuse me, on this project. And one of the things that we really didn't know is we wanted to just have an assessment. What are the, what are the challenges that producers have? Um, what are the things that they're doing to um, control predators? What are the things they're doing to increase production? What are the things they're doing um, to uh, address uh, disease challenges? What are the questions they have? So we did basically a survey of, um, of producers across the United States, and we worked with APA, which you might be familiar with, which is the um, American Association. Poultry Producers Association. American Pastor Poultry Producers Association, thank you. Um, and um, we were able to um, send a survey out. Um, and I want to just go over some of the general findings that we um, that we found. So we sent this out to, 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 to APA members. So you would imagine that the majority of the people, we got 11 responses, so you would imagine the majority of those responses across the country would describe themselves as uh, pastor poultry producers, and, and most pastor poultry producers are, are doing some type of rotation, and there's going to be a, our, our next speaker is going to talk about that, so I'm not going um, to go into that area, in part because I don't know anything about pasture. Um, but um, so the, the majority of the responders rotate their flocks on pasture, um, and they also include livestock species in their, um, on their farm. Um, so that's not too surprising. Um, mobile coops are very common. So the majority of, of, of producers use mobile coops with wire floors. So we'll talk about why, why wire floors might be important um, from a food safety perspective in a minute. Um, this is what I found very interesting, is that predation is the most common source of mortality. So um, I think, you know, there, there's some people out there, you probably are chuckling, like we didn't, you know, we knew that, we didn't need a survey to show that, but it's always nice to have numbers that support your, you know, kind of what anecdotally people are thinking. So that tells us, you know, that, hey, we need to work on, on ways to mitigate predation. And sometimes it's nice to know that as a free range and pastured poultry producer that you have the same problems that other people are having. So it's always nice to know that. The primary challenge is um, uh, includes feed costs, lack of processing facilities, and lack of poultry veterinarian. Um, one of the things about wire floors is that's important to recognize. There are advantages and disadvantages to everything. One of the disadvantages of wire floors is that we identify that as a, as a statistically significant risk factor for salmonella exposure in flocks that utilize those wire floors. And the reason that's probably so is most of these, um, most of these coops that are movable uh, that have wire floors, the birds, uh, some birds are in the coop itself and they poop on the ground, and other birds are actually underneath those wire floors and are being exposed to that coop. So one of the ways that you might want to address that is by having other areas. Why do the birds go underneath the, um, uh, the coop itself? They go because they want shade, they want protection from predators, uh, especially from raptors and things like that. So one of the things that, that we'll talk about in a little is, well, why don't we design, and we design something very simple using PVC pipe um, and shade cloth to basically protect the birds so the birds can go under those spaces instead of going underneath the wire flooring. Um, so there are ways to kind of address some of these type of uh, challenges. Um, other things, the medium pasture stocking density was 22 square feet per hen, and the medium coop stocking density was half a square foot per hen. So the half a square foot per hen is concerning um, because if you look at the laws, the way they're written in California, a half a square foot per hen is about 70, 72 inches per bird. That is technically illegal. Not technically illegal, that is illegal. Um, so you need to have in a uh, free range setting, you need to have at least 116 square inches per bird. So what is one of the ways that we could potentially address this challenge? Um, is to add, is to make those coops um, almost like an aviary, so you can create more um, uh, more space in three dimensions to address that. Um, you know, I get pushback from some of the pastures producers because they'll tell me, well, the birds are just in there. They're not in there 24-7. They're just in there um, at night to protect them from uh, predators. But the issue that I would have 
um, aside from the way the regulation is written, um, the issue I would have is that if we did have an outbreak of disease and those birds actually had to stay in that coop, uh, now we're dealing with the welfare issue. So it's really important, um, just for legal reasons, at the minimum, uh, to stay within that 116 square inches per bird, as opposed to some of the half of the people that responded to this, um, and we went out and measured these things, um, were not in compliance. So we had another survey, uh, different responders were trying to address other issues, feeding and lighting practices. Obviously feeding is so important. Um, so only one of, one of the 14 producers that we interviewed um, or, or that responded to our survey um, actually calculated a feed conversion ratio. So feed conversion ratio is just in the biggest general sense is how much feed are the birds eating uh, is the numerator and the denominator is how many eggs or how much meat are the birds producing. So we want that number to be as low as possible. Um, this is an issue. If we're, not, if we're not understanding our feed conversion ratio, it's really, under, it's really challenging to understand profitability. Um, so this is something that we're really keen to work with producers on. And we've had workshops where we've um, um, started trying to um, identify nice, uh, simple ways to collect this type of data. It's not easy to collect this data because it's not, it's not automated like the conventional systems are. But we can do this, and we've kind of fiddled with it. Um, and there are ways to do this very effectively that we can go into another time. Um, the, um, of the layer farms that, that answer our survey, um, most of them actually were using supplemental light, um, which is great, because supplemental light is really important for egg production. Um, even in these systems, um, it's really important to get uh, approximately 16 hours of light. Um, and depending on where you're listening from, you might, your birds might not be getting 16 hours of light. So uh, providing that supplemental light is, is really uh, fundamental uh, from a production perspective. Uh, Cornish frost were most commonly used for broiler production, and ISA brown and ocelorps were the most commonly used for egg production, which is not too surprising. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but we do have on our website um, a tool for how to um, uh, set up a Google form. So if you are internet inclined, if you are app inclined, Google forms are great. You can generate something like this. Um, and on your phone, you can, uh, you can, you can, you know, ask any question you want and then that'll automatically populate a spreadsheet. Um, and then you can look at that data. So if you have sick birds, um, or if your bird, your egg production is, is, is going down, um, when I talk to a lot of producers, if I ask them if their egg production is going down and they can't answer that, it's really hard to try to identify if there's a problem or not. So um, whether you do this on the internet, whether you do this with a piece of paper, doesn't really matter at all. Um, it's, it's, I'm agnostic as long as you're going to utilize it. That's the most important thing. Um, technology is great when it works. When it doesn't work, I know it's frustrating. I can vouch for that. But um, there are some great tools to do this. And there's also, you know, a good old-fashioned piece of paper and a pencil is also a great tool. So um, it's just important to start collecting data. Um, and, and, and I think the most important thing is to make sure it's useful data. Um, sometimes, and I'll, I, I can vouch for this in the conventional poultry world, there's a lot of data that companies collect that they do absolutely nothing with. So that is kind of useless at that point. So uh, collecting data just to collect data wastes everyone's time. Uh, but if you can identify, like, what are the basics? So if you can just start with feed conversion ratio, um, or you can start with um, how much supplemental lighting you're providing or how many eggs you're getting or what your mortality is. Um, those are great places to start um, and is, is fundamental to really being able to identify problems and also being able to identify, look, this flock is more productive than my last flock. What are the differences? Did I use a different breed of birds? Did I use a different type of feed? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uniformity is also something that's really important and it just requires weighing birds. Uh, uniformity is really important for a lot of reasons, including welfare. Um, so if we have birds that are very large and birds that are very small, that creates, obviously, um, um, challenges with pecking orders and things like that. So having all our birds roughly the same size is really important um, for all kinds of reasons. But it is one of the best indicators of identifying how healthy our flock is. If our flock is uniform, if, meaning that if our flock is around the same weight, all the birds in our flock are around the same weight at two weeks, at three weeks, at four weeks, so on and so forth. Um, those are great signs for how healthy that flock is. 
So the basic of husbandry. So I don't, I don't want to make anything too complicated here. So let's keep it as simple as possible. We want to give them the right feed. So if they're layers, we want to give them a layer feed. If they're chicks, we want to give them a chick feed. If broilers, we want to give them uh, the, the correct broiler feed. We want to give them the appropriate amount of light. Uh, big picture, we want 16 hours of light. We want to give them clean air. So um, if we have um, really wet litter, um, we can get a lot of ammonia. Um, if we have really dry litter, we can get a lot of dust, um, and that can cause some air quality issues also. Uh, it's a fundamental to give them clean water. It amazes me that um, you know all the fancy stuff we talk about, if we can just provide clean water to our birds, and that's really hard to do on these systems, but if we can just provide them clean water, everything else at some level will take care of itself because water is the best predictor of how much they're going to eat. If you don't have clean water, they're not going to eat. If they're not going to eat, they're not going to get to the right weight. If they don't get to the right weight, then they're not going to be in lay when you need them to be in lay. And it's going to take longer to get your, your hens to start producing eggs. So clean water, cleaning your water is out. I know this is not, you know, fancy anything, but it's, it's so fundamental um, to uh, making sure our birds are, are healthy and happy. Uh, space, um, so we talked a little about some of the space um, requirements. We'll talk a little more about those. Um, birds are in a flock, so if you provide them, you know, tons and tons of space, they're still going to kind of travel together um, in, on, on, on kind of a pasture. Very rarely do you see, um, most of the time you see birds clustering at some level. Um, and sanitation is, is essential. Um, so these are all, you know, things that we all kind of know about, but um, it gets a little challenging sometimes to, to kind of remind ourselves and to be disciplined enough to always make sure that we follow um, those basics there. So free range versus pasture poultry. So there is no USDA definition of, of, of these type of production systems. So there are, you know, kind of rough ideas, and I think we, we know it when we see it. Uh, but in general, free-range systems are allowed access to the outside. They typically have a stationary barn. Pasture systems, mainly outside. Uh, the birds are mainly outside all day long. Limited indoor access, usually just at night to protect them from predators. And they have access to grass. That's obviously really important. Um, and most of these coops are mobile um, to take advantage of um, greener grass and other spots. Um, so we'll be talking about that uh, with our next speaker. Um, one of the things I want to point out, you know, since all the people that are listening are commercial producers, it's really important to label your production system appropriately. Um, and it's really confusing. So when you go to the market with someone who doesn't know that much about eggs and you look at all the different labels, it's very confusing. And that means it's really hard for people to realize sometimes which one um, should be priced higher because it's more, um, it's more challenging or it has um, uh, more allure to a consumer. So one of the things that um, there was a study recently that showed that the operating costs of cage-free um, eggs are about 75 cents a dozen, and the operating cost for a colony cage dozen of eggs is about 64 cents a dozen. I think sometimes people, it's really important to realize that it is more expensive for all kinds of reasons to raise our birds in a pastured or free-range setting. That doesn't make it better or worse. That just means that we have to be able to account for that. And part of the ways that we account for that, I think, is by being able to convince and market that those, those eggs as different or special. Um, and the way things are right now, there is a lot of wiggle room on what's pastured and not pastured. I've been out to farms that, you know, when you look at the label, they say pastured, and I wouldn't consider that pasture. I see a dirt pad there. So it's really important to be able to, 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 to really know what you're actually marketing and not marketing and what the costs are associated with some of these systems. So um, when we think about the advantages and disadvantages of these systems, um, we don't have time to kind of go over, you know, kind of in a discussion type setting. Um, but I really want to point out, it doesn't matter what system you're using. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to hear this later from Dr. Bland, but I've been to enough farms, in, in my opinion, um, in, in my lifetime, where if those farms are run well, it doesn't matter what type of husband. It doesn't matter if they're free range or not free range, pastured, cage, uh, colony. If they're run well, they're run well, and the, 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 the product is going to be a safe, healthy, nutritious product. If they're not run well, um, then the product is not going to be a safe, healthy, nutritious product, no matter what system it is. So I think it's really important that 
we think about, you know, when we do our pasture and our free range poultry production, um, then we think about, obviously we want to have pasture there, obviously we want to have free range, we want the birds to be outside, but we, within that system, we want to think about feed, light, air, water, space, and sanitation. That's fundamental, in my opinion. So, just going down the list here, um, with the 15 minutes that we have left, um, feed is essential. Um, you know, we have, I put asterisks, um, asterisks near um, the, the, the feed. Feed can be very challenging for smaller producers to get. So, uh, larger producers can go through four, or five, or six <laughs> different rations, depending on the age of the bird, how much protein, how much calcium, how much phosphorus they need to provide the bird. Uh, it is much more challenging to do that when you have a small flock, if not impossible to do that, because feed mills um, typically only like dealing with much larger with much larger consumers. But the fundamental, if we're just focusing on layer production, the fundamental feed that you need to offer is a starter feed and a layer feed. And you'd be surprised how often people get those confused, and even feed mills get those confused. I was on an operation about probably about six months ago, um, where for their starter feed, it was still a starter feed, um, but the seed mill that produced it was making a pelleted starter feed, and the pelleted starter feed, because of the binders that they were using and because of the way the feed was processed, it wouldn't even break up in my hand. So when I walked into the brooder where these chicks are, these chicks were starving. Their crops were empty, and they were all trying to eat just the dust from the pellet. So it's really important that we feed not only the right ration, but the right consistency of that ration. Um, that when we think about whether we're feeding a pelleted feed, which is appropriate for a layer bird, we don't feed that pelleted feed um, to chicks, which is more appropriate than chicks we should be feeding a, a crumble feed uh, or a mash feed. So it's really important that we pay attention and that we um, try to optimize and work with uh, feed mills um, in order to optimize what type of feed we're giving um, our birds. This is probably the most challenging issue that you're going to run into because feed is expensive. It's 70% of your operating cost. It's probably a little lower when you're on these pasture settings because the birds will eat some grass, they'll eat bugs, which is a great protein source. Um, so you're going to displace some of those calories by having them uh, free range. Um, but it is a real challenge to um, really optimize uh, how much starter you're going to give those birds, how much of a layer ration you're going to give them. Um, in general, you want to have the starter, the birds feed off the starter for at least eight weeks. Um, and, and, and if you only have an option of a starter and a layer ration, then you would um, feed them the starter ration until they're about 16 weeks or so, and then you can transition to a layer ration. Um, so we'll talk about calcium, but just in the interest of time, I'm in, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that um, part of it. But calcium is fundamental to um, layer birds, um, and it's really important that if a bird is going to eat 100, 120 grams of feed at the layer every single day, it's important um, that about four to four and a half percent of that diet be calcium. If we are feeding them something else um, that that is not rich in calcium. Um, then those birds are going to have problems. Um, that's when you start running into, into all kinds of problems with respect to nutritional diseases and also with the uh, thickness of eggs, the eggshells themselves. Um, so there's a lot of different types of feeders and waters. For the most part, I'm agnostic on what systems people use. Um, the most important part is to keep them clean. Uh, there are advantages, uh, for example, on, on nipple waters uh, versus um, the bell waters. Um, the bill waters need to be cleaned uh, typically almost every single day, especially if there's a lot of dirt there. The, the best way to get a chicken sick with salmonella or E. coli is to have them ingest the actual bacteria themselves. So keeping the water as clean is really, is really fundamental. Um, the locations of feeders and waters, it's really important to think about where you put them. So if you put feeders and waters just outside in an area where um, there's no cover, um, and the birds can be preyed upon um, by raptors, for example. Birds are smart. They're not going to go into those, um, they're not going to eat and drink as much, and, and, and they're not going to be as productive then. So one of the things that we've done is we've put our feeders and waters under 
um, not our, our coop itself, but we put it under our PVC um, kind of structure that's about um, one and a half feet off the ground. And if we put the feeders and waters under there, the birds can use that for shade. They can use that to nibble off the grass and we can move those things around in order to allow the birds to eat more of the pasture and to kind of um, make sure they're not denuding the grass. Um, and then we can also um, um, make sure that they're, that, they're, that they're not putting those feeders and waters in places that they're not gonna utilize them um, because of predator concerns, for example. So lighting, you can give whole talks on lighting. Um, it's really important, um, especially with laying birds, um, to make sure that we're getting adequate light for our birds. Uh, one of the things in our survey um, is that it was interesting people were providing light for their layer birds, supplemental light, either in the morning or the evening or the combination of the morning and evening to get up to that 16 hours, but they weren't using lux meters. Lux meters are one of the ways we can measure the intensity of the light. Um, and that's, you know, kind of one of these things that are, is really important to, to try to understand and optimize. If you give them too intense light, um, you can start getting double yolk, double yolk eggs, for example. If you give them too intense of a light, they can become more aggressive. Um, so there is, you know, as we all know, too much of a good thing is, is not a good thing. But space requirements, this is California, so this could be a whole talk or literally like a whole, um, a, a, a whole seminar on this. Um, one of the things I want to point out is um, whether just, just the comparison. I know the people that are, that are here, that are listening online are not um, probably as involved in the conventional poultry industry. Um, but if you went to Iowa, for example, um, and you looked at the space requirements of the cage birds there, depending on the breed, whether they're white birds or brown birds, they would have 67 um, to about 80 square inches per bird. Um, we do have these enriched cages, um, and those enriched cages have nest boxes and perches, and um, they have some type of litter substrate in there, um, almost like a piece of AstroTurf. Um, those birds uh, have 116 square inches. That's a California law, um, and that basically is to allow those birds um, to stand up and turn around with their, with, um, with their wings spread. Um, Cage-free, and this is all about the change, um, but right now, cage-free in California, they need at least 116 square inches. And that was really interesting in that, in that uh, survey that we did that half of the respondents um, have their, um, their birds in less than those 116 square inches. Um, even below the 72, um, they, were, they were in less than a half a square foot per bird. So it is interesting that these birds, like when they go out in the pasture, they're in this beautiful kind of Norman Rockwell type setting and they've got tons of room. Um, when they get in the coop, um, you know, everything is kind of, um, kind of a little tighter. You know, the other argument that I didn't say earlier that is, is, is that I think a legitimate argument um, under perfect conditions is that those birds at night are going to be on roosting bars anyhow. So if they're on roosting bars, why does the square footage matter? Um, I think that's a legitimate argument, but the law is the law, and, and unfortunately that's just the reality of, of what you have to kind of consider. What I always tell producers is to just create some more three-dimensional space like an aviary, and then you can follow the law even if the birds don't go into those spaces. Um, there are different auditing groups. So um, as you become uh, commercial producers, um, there are specific auditing groups that will go out and measure um, and approve uh, the different types of uh, square footage will we'll, we'll, we'll measure basically uh, the space that these birds have. We're going to have a speaker later, I think um, at the end of the month, uh, Dr. Richard Blatchford, who's an expert um, um, in welfare and behavior, and he'll be talking a little more about this. But one of the things I want to point out, when you look at Animal Welfare Approved, which is one auditing agency, and Certified Humane, which is another auditing agency, there's a pretty significant difference there um, on the amount of square footage that these birds get. And, you know, when I look at, you know, kind of, you know, kind of what's behind that, the nuts and bolts of that, there's not a lot of research there. And a lot of that's because different birds are going to have different um, requirements um, and, and different um, behavior. So, you know, they're, they're trying to make kind of this, you know, one size fits all, and I understand why they try to do that. Um, requirement as far as how to get um, um, approval from each one of these uh, different auditing groups. But it's important to think about those numbers as you design and um, optimize uh, your own coops and your own pasture and your own free range system um, to see what you need to do, how many bird hypothetically you could have. 
these numbers, and, and I think this is where it gets really challenging, these numbers don't take into account, you know, if you are rotating your birds on pasture, it doesn't really take into account you know, how quickly that grass is going to grow back every time you move your birds. And that's, 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 I think, a really challenging and interesting um, topic here. Um, so bedding material. Um, so um, obviously if your birds are free range or on pasture when they're outside, they're, they're on grass or, or dirt. Um, for the most part, they don't need any type of substrate or bedding material. Uh, but inside the coop, um, at night when they're uh, when they're pooping, there's feeders in there, there's waters in there. It's really important to have bedding material. Um, and if you don't take good care of that bedding material, you can have a lot of, um, uh, of feet problems. Um, so bumblefoot is, is something that can happen, especially if you don't take care of your um, um, your substrate material. Whether that substrate material is rice holes, so we're in California now, so we have access to lots of rice holes, which is a great bedding material. Wood shavings, as long as you're not using hardwoods, is also a great bedding material. Um, the most important part is that when you walk into your coop, it doesn't smell like ammonia, um, and that when you pick up the bedding material, it doesn't, um, you can't squeeze it and get moisture out of it, or when you pick up the bedding material, it doesn't aerosolize and cause respiratory problems. So you want to have that happy medium, in a perfect world, if you can get about six inches of bedding material, I know that's hard to do, but if you can get six inches of bedding material at least, um, that allows the birds basically to rototill um, the fecal material back into um, the rice holes or the wood shavings. And if you do that and you manage that correctly, you will not have to change their bedding material for the entire length of that flock, for the entire life cycle of that flock. So uh, bedding can be your best friend. It can also be really challenging to work with. Um, and especially when you have too much ammonia or too much moisture. Straw, in my opinion, is not a very good bedding material. It's not absorbent at all. So it's great in nest boxes um, because then your eggs aren't going to crack at all. It's kind of giving you that nice kind of padding and packing. Um, but straw is, uh, does not absorb very well. People sometimes try to chop up the straw, um, and I'm not sure how much success um, they have with that. But in its normal form, um, straw is not something that I would recommend. But it's great for nest boxes. So predator control, so, you know, from looking at our surveys, and I, trust me, I'm not very smart, and I'm not always the best listener, um, but if I listen to enough surveys, and I listen to enough farmers telling me that we have predator issues, um, then eventually it finally clicks that, you know, we need to do, um, make efforts when it comes to predator control. Um, so there is no silver bullet, so um, unfortunately I, I wish there were. I wish um, all those um, things I click on when I type in, predator mitigation or predator control on the internet. I wish they all were as, as great as they say they are, um, but they're just not. And, and the reality is, is that the fancier stuff, um, which I'm a sucker for, doesn't really work very well, but the, the basics are the best. Fencing, um, fencing is gonna be your best friend. So um, it, 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 I know it's, it's hard because you say, well, the first part of the talk we're talking about how important water is, and the second part of the talk we're talking about how important fencing is, that is not groundbreaking research, right, from a university. You guys know that. But it kind of reminds us it's the basics that are, if we can do the basics well, we can, we can be really, I think, uh, very productive um, and, 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 and utilize these systems uh, well. The one thing I will point out to you is that um, the fencing is only as good as its weakest spot. We know that intuitively, but I don't know how many people have ever walked around their fence line and looked for holes and gaps and I've spent some time on our farm walking around with people that are really good at predator control and know a lot about more, more than I know about wildlife. And they will just, they will nitpick every single gap and hole. And, and the thing they point out is that predators are smart. They will keep on probing a fence until they figure out how to get underneath it. Um, and, you know, even that gate that you open up that's got that, you know, two or three or four inches of space there, that is an easy way for predator to get in. If you see it, they're going to see it way before you see it. So it's really important um, to really be uh, fastidious when it comes to that type of stuff. Um, and it's still not going to be perfect, but at least you're, you're making, um, you're doing the best you can to make the, the appropriate um, uh, effort. The other thing I point out, we're not going to talk about biosecurity um, in this talk, but the good thing about predator control and biosecurity is you're kind of doing the same thing. Uh, biosecurity, we're trying to prevent diseases from outside the farm, from getting onto the farm. Predator control, uh, those predators, just because they're wildlife, are going to have all kinds of bacteria, potentially, that they're carrying. Uh, Ectoparasites, viruses, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can do a pretty good job of predator control, 
We're also improving our biosecurity at the same time. The nature of pasture poultry and free range is, is challenging um, in the sense that uh, we are never going to be perfect uh, when it comes to predator control. We're never going to be perfect when it comes to wildlife. Um, but we, we obviously want to honor and um, still utilize those pastured poultry and free range uh, management and, and husbandry practices. Uh, but we just want to do it as well as we can. Um, so it's really good to just know what kind of wildlife you have. Um, this slide here I think is really interesting. So where, where you see my cursor, uh, when we were um, um, uh, a couple years ago when we were putting our pasture, when we were when we were seeding our pasture, this is my ignorance as someone who doesn't know a lot about pasture and wildlife, um, we noticed after the grass started growing um, that we started having all these uh, uh, geese that were starting to show up. Uh, a couple weeks later, they didn't show up anymore uh, because the grass grew more. Um, so obviously waterfowl, like geese and ducks, can be um, a source of all kinds of diseases. So it was interesting to note that. And as the grass grew more, those birds all went to um, different crops around, around campus. Um, they stopped coming there. Um, so you have to know what you're up against. Um, and um, obviously, you know, understanding what you're up against, not just during the day, understanding at night. We've got all kinds of good cameras that we can help us with that. Um, stuck here. Moving on the laptop. Oh, there we go. I'm not going to touch anything. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm stopping. So these are those shade structures I was talking about. Nothing fancy, PVC pipe and shade cloth. Birds can go underneath, you can put feeders, you can put waters there, you can easily move those so the birds will, will nibble on the grass. Um, you can get um, predator repellent tape. Um, this is one of those things, if you look up here, you see that kind of tinfoil stuff? So in California, where you see vineyards and things like that, as we're driving down uh, 99 or a small road, we see those types of uh, predator repellent tape that the reflection is supposed to bother um, birds and things like that. Um, not very effective, but always worth a try. Um, there's these uh, coyote decoys. Again, not very effective unless you're really willing to move those things every single day, probably two or three times a day. But it'll scare, you know, it's, it's a good April Fool's joke for um, <laughs> maybe someone on your farm. Uh, fencing, again, is, is really our best friend, and in a perfect world, you'd have some kind of buffer zone there, so you can really understand uh, how the fence line and the dirt um, interact with each other, so you can look for footprints of predators and things like that. I know that's hard for people that can't always have that kind of buffer, um, but at least if you can keep the grass down uh, low in that space, that might be um, helpful. Um, so electric fencing is also really important. Um, this would be a fence within a fence, and this is really important if you are rotating your birds. Um, so these are portable electric fences that are powered by um, a, 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 solar, um, a solar cell. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about, again, is we have, and Dr. Bland is going to talk about this, uh, but I just want to point out and want to make sure um, that you guys are aware of the resources you have. This is not just in California. In California, we have the California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab. Other states have very similar systems, and if you have sick or dead birds, um, it is so important to submit your birds to the cath lab. It is a nominal fee, um, and this is essential because this will help you identify what diseases your birds might have, and hopefully help us manage our way out of that um, disease, whether it's nutritional or infectious, uh, metabolic. Um, it's a great resource. There are literally you know, there's four locations throughout California, and we've got bacteriologists, virologists, pathologists, every ologist you can imagine um, for a nominal fee are going to help identify what's wrong with your sick or dead bird. So it's a great resource, and, and I encourage you guys to utilize it. Dr. Bland, uh, looking at the, his face, is going is to talk about that in more detail later on. So I'm not going to steal his thunder. So with that, I'm going to switch to our next speaker. Um, Let's plan, if there are any questions, just so we can stay on time, let's plan on, on having answering those questions.